Now suppose we go into the lab. We open up the cabinet underneath the hood and we grab a bottle of nitric acid. And you see that that's what we're talking about throughout this slide, HNO3. We grab that bottle out and we ask ourselves a nice philosophical question. What do I actually have in this bottle? Do I have just concentrated HNO3? Do I have H plus and NO3 minus? Or do I have some ratio of the two uh, cases? Do I have some of it dissolved and dissociated? And is the rest just dissolved but not dissociated? Well, if we're looking at this fraction of dissociation, what we're saying is basically what fraction of the molecules, in other words, you can think of this as being percentage with just the decimal slid, what percentage of those are actually going to be popped apart? Now, if we go to that very concentrated bottle, turns out that we're going to be saying that almost none of it is going to be dissolved and dissociated. It's just going to be dissolved. As we dilute things more and more, notice this is our formal concentration, as we add more water to that, we're going to have more and more of those molecules are going to be dissociated. Now let's take a look at some of the reasons why and connect that to what we know about Ka. So HNO3, its Ka value is very large. We're used to seeing these being fractions rather than whole numbers, let alone fairly big whole numbers, right? It's 26.8. Now if we look at Ka, that tells us that we expect almost none of it to be in the associated form and most of it to be in the dissociated form. But wait a minute. That's completely the opposite of what you just told us, right? Well, what I just told you. We just looked at a case where it's almost completely associated. And then as we go to more dilute conditions, it changes dramatically. That doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to us. Well, let's go through and actually kind of convert that to a more usable form, just to make sure that we have a strong understanding of whether this is a strong acid or, or a weak acid. Okay, now, if we want to know pKa. pKa is a great way to know for sure if it's a strong or weak acid. So we're going to go ahead and say pKa equals negative log. Remember, we take negative log of whatever we're turning into a p value. In this case, we're turning Ka into a pKa. So we're going to put negative log of 26.8. And so when we grab our calculator, we're going to get negative 1.43. And we put the calculator away, and without waking up our minds at all, you know, we haven't had our coffee yet, we say, okay, there's our answer. But unpack that a little bit. Remember, we've said that our pKa is typically going to be on the scale of 0, or realistically more like 1, to 14. How is this a negative number? And what does that tell us? Well, simply put, it's going to tell us that we're even further on the acidic end than you can be in water. And if you hit that pH, I'm sorry, pKa of less than, let's say, 1, it's going to be considered to be a strong acid because it's going to dissolve and dissociate and pop apart every time. Now that is what we're seeing for reasonably dilute concentrations, even down to like concentrations of about three units. You can see that we're still here where we have about, I'd say that's probably about 93% dissociated. So 93% of it at this pH will actually be, at uh, this concentration will actually be popped apart and dissociated. So that sounds like something that's reasonable for a strong acid. But what's actually going on as we go further and further down? A big hint for that is for us to actually look at this secondary x-axis that they posted. Here what they're doing is they're looking at the number of water molecules versus HNO3 molecules. Remember, what we're saying if we have this formal concentration changing is that we're changing how many of these molecules are present in the water. You can also picture a case where eventually we're going to have the entire volume just made up of our HNO3 molecules with barely any water molecules present. Now if we look at that ratio, here we've still got a 3 to 1 ratio of water for every nitric acid. And you can see that even then, even when we have three molecules for each, we're all the way down here at probably about 40% dissociated. That's a pretty low number. So if we're down to having only three water molecules, things are starting to really stay attached. They're staying associated. If we get down to a one-to-one -one ratio, you can see that barely any of the molecules are actually popping apart, or maybe like 9 or 10 percent. And if we get concentrated to the point where we only have half a water molecule per HNO3, in other words, we have two nitric acids for every one water molecule, 
you can see we're barely getting these apart at all. So if we could get a case where we have totally pure nitric acid, in other words, we have no water molecules present whatsoever, we should have liquid phase, HNO3, and none of it will actually be dissolved or dis oh, will actually be dissociated into the H plus ion or the NO3 minus ion. Now, this is one of the reasons that analytically we work at lower concentrations as often as possible because it prevents us from being in some of that weird case. Now, when we need, need to calculate fraction of dissociation, this is one of the reasons we need to have such a specific term as formal concentration. In formal concentration, what we're saying is, let's take away the confusion when you opened up the cabinet under the hood and you didn't know whether it was totally associated or not associated. Let's just say that I don't care whether it's currently in the dissociated form, and I'm just going to kind of leave these almost like as an ion pair with this dirty notation, just to emphasize what I'm showing. This is an amapsa. That's going to be it detached. This is going to be it attached. If we add up all of these forms, so this paired form and this form, we know that we're going to still have the original amount that we put in, our formal concentration. So formal concentration is going to be either one of these two. Like I said, this isn't a mathematical division sign. That's just the separator. So the concentration of H plus plus concentration of NO3. Better still would be to say, yeah, forget that part. Let's only talk about the really, really obvious thing that we can't have any confusion with based on systematic treatment of equilibrium. We can see that we only have the nitrate ion present in the original HNO3. And so if we add up these two, we should get our formal concentration. So while this might often be mathematically correct using H+, it's dirty and it's likely to fall apart for us in more complicated cases, anything more than simple cases, really. So let's stay with the much better version. Let's stay with this species, the progeny of the HNO3 original ion becoming the nitrate ion as well. And that's going to be our formal concentration is this sum. Now, if we want to know the fraction that's actually dissociated, what we're going to do is say, great, let's look at the part that is dissociated. So let's take the concentration present as NO3 minus. Doesn't look much like a 3, but you'll have that. There we are. NO3 minus. We need to know how much of it's in this form compared to how much is present. And the easiest way to do that is use formal concentration. Do that. We've got our fraction of dissociation. We could also do fraction of association, which still gets the same alpha. So make sure that you're looking at the text to see if you're talking dissociation or association. And of course, if it was the fraction of association, we'd be looking at HNO3 versus formal concentration. And we'd see the graph just be completely reversed from that. But hopefully this gets you some idea of why we see fraction of dissociation matter so much, why we stay at dilute concentrations, a reminder of what Ka looks like and pKa looks like for really strong acids, and gives us some idea of how formal concentration gets entangled with fraction of dissociation.